Hello there, it is Monday, July 13th, 2020. My name is Ko Im. I'm the community editor and podcast co-host here at Adweek, and you're tuned in to another episode of Adweek Together, our weekly live series covering the future of something, right? So the future of culture is our topic today. But before we get to our special guests, we want to remind you to sign up for an Adweek subscription to get unlimited access to our essential content and resources. You can learn more at adweek.com slash offer. Today we have from Team Epiphany, the managing partners, Coltrane Curtis and Lisa Chu. Hi guys. Hi. I'm Coltrane, that's Lisa. <laughs> if you didn't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, we are going to first get into who you are and what you do. Wow, um, you wanna start? Um, well, first we're married and I, I started an agency 15 years ago, 16 years ago, but I work for her. So I'm allow her to start first. So Coltrane started the agency 15, 16 years ago. Um, and as most agencies are, they lie their way to winning the business. And then he needed someone to do the work. So we were dating at the time. And he was like, hey, don't you want to like come and work here and do this work? And I was like, I don't know about this. But yeah, that's kind of how we started the business uh, with this guy, George Fertitta, he helped us out at the time uh, and it really looked out for us. We were a small agency, four people sitting around a conference room, table, one phone, one ethernet cord, making it work. And here we are. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a story of just like good old American muscle where you kind of like build something, you become good at it and you hope that, you know, you know, your skill set allows you to kind of earn new opportunities. Um, I think what was really interesting, Lisa really talked about it, but it was like, you know, we were able to barter offer space, you know, with bigger agencies kind of like selling cultural currency to them yeah. um, and then bartering space. And so for the first seven, seven, eight years of our business, um, literally that relationship happened. And so what we were able to do was really, you know, understand that the cost of business is what puts you out of business and being able to mitigate against kind of like those overhead costs. And then also being able to give home to some of our creative friends in New York City knowing the fact that they were either leaving a job or looking for a space to kind of like a creative space. So this is kind of like pre we work. Right. Um, and we kind of created this kind of like oasis of, of creativity and safeness uh, right. in New York City. And the business has grown to be about, you know, 30 mil in size, about 80 employees, New York, L.A. And um, you're looking at the only two owners. Right. Um, and so we did it the old school way. Right. Like we earned it. Right. So, yeah, uh, and, and two people of color, right? Managing this um, company, like you said, you've grown and survived and um, hopefully <laughs> thrived, right? Throughout throughout the years, you have a very diverse makeup in your workforce. I want to get a little bit deeper into that cultural currency that you're talking about. You had a specific kind of mission and outlook and perspective when you started. Um, and it feels like now, you know, do you feel like you're more valued for the perspective that you bring and then what yeah. you do to try to enlighten people, disrupt how things are being done. Yeah, um, want to go first real quick? So, I'll go. Um, so the first thing is my dad ran an agency um, for 25 years. Uh, we have two kids, Count and Ellington, they're two and eight. And I grew up in my dad's agency and I also knew that that was one of the things that helped create who I am. And so our kids are gonna grow up in our agency. And so I think when you build something, you know, whose goals are a little bit different than a PL, and l um, you know, we wanna create an environment that's not only, you know, influences everything that we do and the work that we do, but also an environment that our kids will actually grow up in. And being of, you know, um, of, you know, multicultural descent, she and I both, um, it was just very important for us to put those different personalities and those different interests and those people who are driving culture um, in one space to kind of create work. And so for us, we've always been diverse. We don't know how not to be, you know, we're a reflection of our culture and our community. Um, but it was just something that was very important to us from a, from a, from a early, early age. What do you, what do you I think? Mean, yeah. I feel like often, um, especially with big companies, they always like make you fill out a questionnaire when you, first win the business, like, what do you do to incorporate diversity into your company? How diverse are you? Like, what are the percentages? What's the breakdown? And my answer is really simply, we don't need to try. We don't have a program. We are who we are. We've always been this way. 
we've always hired people because they do great work, but we've always hired people that we can relate to that can relate to our work. It's hard to interject people who don't get it. Um, and we've tried that before. We, you know, trial and error a lot <laughs> over the last 16 years. Um, you know, you hire this person who's like a big wig at this agency and they come over and they totally don't get the work or the culture. Um, we run our company like a family. You know, it's very personal. We take it very seriously, but we also really care about the people. They're not just like a number. We generally care about every baby that's born, every marriage that happens, every family, like, situation that someone needs to step out for like you don't take it as like oh okay well that person's disposable just because they're not available and right. diversity, and diversity in thought is also just influences all of our pieces of business right like so you know when you say bring your whole self to work like i don't want somebody living like a, uh you know a lie during the middle of the week and, and living it up on the weekend i want them to bring their whole self because you know what their interests are actually influences all of the work that we do like, you know, um, you know, you think about running an agency for 15 years, like I started when I was 30. Right. You know, like what I look like at 30, you know, um, is different. <laughs> what I look like at 30 is a lot different. Right. But like the reality is, it's like it keeps us youthful. It keeps us sharp. It keeps us on not what's happening now, but what's happening next. Right. And it's our job to give our clients, you know, a glimpse into the future, not something that they would necessarily read in the times. Right. Like if we're reporting the news, then read the news, right? It's for us to kind of predict what the news is going to be writing about. And then how can we kind of like take that and then create kind of like branded programs because of that insight. Right. It's okay. But Lisa and I still look, you know, yeah. <laughs> 10 years younger than we are. But yeah. <laughs> that's just a joke. Um, but I want to, I used to have hair. So, you know, like, a lot of hair. A lot of hair. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think you now have a lot of case studies to show what having you know a culture of diversity um, and a commitment to diversity it's just like an unspoken accepted uh, rule or base um, for example i want to bring up recently you know you worked on um, with hbo for insecure's uh, season four a block party and mm -hmm. i wouldn't think that unless you know you maybe were a super fan of the show and part of the community that you might have come up with idea and executed it in specific ways. Um, how does this example, you know, show the strength of diversity and thought? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing is like, you know, when we launched that, so we're, we've been working with HBO for eight or nine years now, um, for, for a while. And I would just look at ourselves as an extension of their team, you know, um, we've grown with them, they've grown, um, you know, but when you really think about block party and community, you know, when we first started working on Insecure Five, four or five years ago, four seasons ago, right? Um, you know, it was, we've been doing block parties for them since inception, you know? It's now just become part of, you know, scripted, it's scripted, right? So season four is really about, you know, Issa and kind of like creating a block party. But year, year one, we did a block party in Brooklyn. Year two, we did a block party in Inglewood. Year three, we did a block party, you know, at LAFC for 4,500 people, right? And then we were planning on doing four block parties this year in four different markets and then you know the world literally flipped and we had to pivot to virtual um and so we were one of the first agencies um to kind of like take a crack at it and it literally became kind of the blueprint to follow in terms of how to do it well um and little did we know um at the end of the season we closed the season with a virtual block party too and so when you're really thinking about community what is community community is not really thinking about self it's about bringing everyone with you on a voyage um, it's about responsibility to your neighborhood, your block, to, you know, to, you know, the future of your community. Um, and I think that block party piece was, um, um, it's, it's really weird when your strategy becomes kind of like your tagline for it. But when you really think about, you know, the success of in Insecure, it's about a community and a village that's great to watch, but it's also behind the camera, the community that East has built. Right. And so what we wanted to do was vibe off of that and then kind of create something. But I think the big challenge and a testament to Lisa's team was the fact that they were able to pivot a traditional. Right. I, I use that word loosely, a traditional production team um, and then being able to switch gears quickly and then being able to kind of produce a polydisciplined virtual experience that had everything from performances to, you know, live chats on Twitter with Issa to seating programs. So. Um, when you think about it, you know, um, 
you're only able to do that with a team who understands the importance of an insecure um, and it's an incredibly diverse team too. Yeah, and Lisa, I, I want to ask you about you know what other brands companies can think about when you know shifting to virtual. How do you keep the aspect of community and culture in place? Um, any specific recommendations, or you know, is it really that holistic view from the top that guides strategy and execution? I think it is a holistic view, but I think they, the brands need to understand who their core audience is and stay true to that. Like Insecure has, in season four especially, such a big following that there's little touch points that you have to stay true to or nothing works. You know, I think a lot of people have pivoted to a virtual something, a party, a cocktail or whatever, a tune in. And some of them are great and some of them are just falling a little flat because it's just, it doesn't mean anything to the people that they're targeting. And I think that also you have to understand that that audience has to shift with you and tune in virtually. So that is also another push. So I think, you know, the strategy has to stay true to the core of like what the brand is and, you know, who the target is. Yeah. Let's talk about another example. Um, you know, I think there's a shift in how everyone is really thinking about influencers too. Yeah. Uh, you guys have uh, an upcoming campaign yeah. where you know, you're tapping into the new nostalgic cultural, new and nostalgic cultural trend of drive-ins but the influencers are different this time around what's, what's going on with that culture yeah so um top of this year you know we won i would say the biggest piece we've ever won a business which was uh influencer marketing for audi you know um and you know we've been working behind the scenes on influencer strategy not just the individual but the community that they belong to you know and you know you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't get an opportunity to put an event in the world, right? But who do we know? How do we know that, you know, six months starting the business that, you know, we were producing our first event, you know, through quarantine, you know, through literally, you know, a, a, a race revolution that we're having in the country. And we're actually producing a drive-in experience, not a movie theater, but a drive-in experience with our Audi client uh, this week in LA, um, where 60 influencers who are actually influential, right? Like not like a professional influencer, but when you think about the influencers that we're really looking towards now are our frontline workers um, and also supporting, supporting small black businesses. And so, you know, when you really think about how can we traverse this world that we live in, if everybody does their little part um, and for ours, it's a little, it's entertainment. It's a little bit of a distraction, right? Um, and so what we've decided to do is identify 30 small black business owners and 30 um, frontline workers in LA that we've been kind of like supporting throughout um, and give them something to look forward to. And so we're seating them with a vehicle uh, for a weekend, uh, for a week actually. And then they are tasked with the day of the performance to actually go to an undisclosed location in their cars, having a safe social distance drive-in performance and Kehlani's performing, right? And so when you really think about it, it's, you know, it's something that is difficult to do under any circumstances. Um, and now it's, you know, what was easy before um, is difficult and what was difficult is impossible. And of course we pick difficult, um, but for us it's not impossible. We're really excited about it, but it's really about just, you know, the team digging deep, wanting to do something, understanding that the significance of the experience, yes, um, it's gonna be a great Audi piece, but it's also something that helps our culture and our community. Um, yeah. And we're, we're, you know, at times I'm always, I'm, I struggle with like, who do I work for, right? Is it is it for the brand? <laughs> Um, or is it for the community and culture? And the reality is, is it's for both. And sometimes we have to answer to community before we answer the brand. And that right. becomes a little test for a great experience. But that's great when it becomes win-win, right? And the, the brand see that, the community feels that, and you have this overall great kind of ripple effect, um, which happens with influence and culture and community. Um, you know, you talked about how uh, we need entertainment and also how you struggled with a variety of things. We've all struggled with a variety of things. Um, what are the kind of, you know, in the midst of all this new business and work that we're trying to get out and think about in new ways, um, what are the difficult conversations that you've been having, whether it's internally or with um, clients or even, you know, with your community? Hmm. Me, I mean, you. I think Me? You go. I mean, I think with our community it's not a conversation that's new to anyone i think everyone's been talking about it for most of their lives 
I feel like for our, some of our clients, not all our clients, they are asking us to help out, you know, help out. What can they do differently? How can they change things? What can they do to participate? And some people, it's cutting a check. Other people, it's higher within. Other and others, it's like do more, be more, like find something that really, you know, is going to make a difference for you. And let's just be honest: some brands don't really want to do anything but cut a check. But that's okay too because you need to cut a check because somebody needs that check, right? So I think it's just different tiers of help. Um, I mean that as you. And I feel, I feel like for our internal group, Coltrane, and I struggled with that for a minute because we didn't know what to say. It was hmm. so heart-wrenching and we just didn't have the words and we really, for the first time, had nothing to say on our team meeting. And then we were like, we have to get back to you because there's really, like, we're, we're stuck. Yeah, and I feel like that's okay, you know? Like, I think what we really look to help kind of direct our clients is how we kind of direct ourselves right mm -hmm. uh, not knowing what to do is okay as long as you're having the conversation and we continue to have that conversation you know and that conversation led us to you know hey like a lot of our kids i call them kids because i'm 45 <laughs> and average age of the agency is around 27 so like some could be my kids um but you know the kids were protesting you know they're peacefully protesting um and which we were happy to find out um but what we also realized was that 100 percent of them have never been arrested um while protesting or doing anything and so what we really did is we looked deep and we looked at them as like, hey, what happens if one of our kids grow up and get you know, arrested? What would we want to happen for them? Um, and so what we did is we actually um, you know, worked with our legal counsel, um, gave everybody one, gave everybody at the agency um, our home number, um, our legal counsel cell number. We put money in escrow. And then if anybody was to be arrested, um, that they can reach out to us 24 hours a day um, wow. and we would have to actually help them get out. And what that actually did was that it was very small. It was something that was very specific to us. But if you can help one person out, that's one more person that, you know, is that has the potential of making the world a better place. And so we give our clients the same feedback. Right. Um, you know, a lot of them try to move as big as they are. And what we explain to them is that if you move smaller and you roll your sleeves up, that can have greater impact than the, the, the big check that you can cut. And so a lot of times we really look inward to ex to execute externally. Um, but honestly, it, it really just came from counsel with my wife and she was, you know, well, everybody's like, what are you going to make a statement? You know, and I was like, well, you know, our existence is resistance. Our existence is protest. You know, when you think about our agency and what it means and how we're configured, you know, um, you know, how we comprise um, the fact that we exist is protest. Right. And so, you know, the kids were like, we want to do something. I was like, all right, well, let's listen and figure out how we can support them. And so you know, one thing led to another thing led to another thing, but everything that we did internally at the agency is now affecting external work that we're doing for a client. Yeah, and I think what you bring up is, you know, listening as leadership, compassionate conversations, mm -hmm. and also taking anything that's big, right? We learn about this in any project that we do, breaking it them down into small steps. So I guess my last question for you guys is, you know, what other maybe advice or example do you want to share? Mm. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, <laughs> like I, I pitch capabilities three times a day to brands, you know, um, and, 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 you know, it's, 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 it, you can't pitch those things and you can't do anything unless you are comprised of really incredible talented people. Um, and when you really look at like, you know, you're rendered useless without the people that are on your team, you look at them a little bit different. You look at them as family, you look at them as it's, you know, they work with us, but it's our job to be responsible for everything that they work towards, right? Like people work to provide for others and it's not our job to just provide for opportunity for the people that work for us. It's our job to listen and understand why they work and be, and be connected to that level. And, you know, I think that for that I, I would just say that philosophy of running a business is challenging when you're big. Right. And so for us, it's challenging now because we've never dreamed that we would be 80 people. Right. But the size isn't what represents or is indicative of a successful agency for us. Right. Um, and my wife always keeps me particularly on the right side of these things. Right. Because you kind of like lose. I'm winning business. How are we going to do it? How are we going to execute it? But why are we doing it? Why do we want to do it? Right. We're doing it because 
like it galvanizes us. It brings us together. And I think that this time that we're in now, I think one of the hardest things for us is the fact that we just can't go to work. The fact that we are now like literally been living without the people that literally she and I sit in every single job interview for the last 15 years. These are our friends. These are our family. These are our people. And so for us not to be able to be connected with them has been really tough. But I would say the biggest thing is, is respect the people who work for you and, 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 and understand what drives them and what makes them good. Because, um, you know, when we have average tenure at Team Epiphany is almost like six years for employees and clients, which is unheard of, right? Um, and for us, we don't know any other way, you know? I had to stop, like, like I, you know, letting people go because I would be the guy that would be crying in, 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 you know, in those meetings because I don't want to let anybody go, you know? But the reality is, is, you know, I'm connected to everyone. And it really just starts with my wife making sure that we sit on the right side of things, you know, um, because the business can sometimes overshadow, you know, the personal piece. I mean, yeah, that's my one advice is the same advice I give to everyone about everything. Just be on the right side of life. Like, I feel like running a business, there's so many ways to be on the wrong side of life and do people dirty or, you know, look at people not as humans, but as numbers in I always tell culture, even like when somebody messes up and you're like ready to like fire them, I'm like, listen, I get it, but we have to like be on the right side of life. You can't just like kick somebody out the door. Like you have to do right by them. They have a family, they have a life, they have things that they have. Like, and I'm big on karma. Like <laughs> being That's Chinese, I'm huge <laughs> I'm good of karma. Like putting bad things out there will come back on us in so many different ways. So I always tell them like, even if clients are coming at us crazy or doing something crazy, like just try to be on the right side of life and it will work out. I promise you. The yin and yang of life, of <laughs> yep, agency yep. life is right here. Yep. And it has <laughs> like right integrity right in between, right? The yin and yang. But I want to thank you guys, Coltrane Curtis and Lisa Chu from Team Epiphany uh, for spending some time with us. I wish we had more time because um, this is an important conversation, but I really appreciate it. And good luck on the campaign this week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take that luck. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank our audience for tuning in. I know Brenda was congratulating the team on winning that business. And Chelsea said, I'm excited to listen, love the work the agency is producing. Make sure to tune in next week uh, for our conversation about the future of audio with Julie Clark from Spotify. And in the meantime, you can unlock essential content and resources from Adweek with a pro subscription at adweek.com slash offer. For Adweek, I'm Ko Im. Have a great week.